Good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming to the Telehealth Science of Addressing Addictive Behaviors and Psychosocial Lifestyle Challenges. Uh, my name is Louise Knott. I'm a project officer for the Telehealth Resource Center program within the Office for the Advancement of Telehealth at the Health Resources and Services Administration, um, and I'll be the moderator for the session. Our speaker is Bob Gold, the Chief Behavioral Technologist at GOMO, or GOMO Health, um, and uh, Bob will present first, and then we'll take questions at the end. If you're tuning in virtually, you can put your questions in the chat or um, feel free to mute, unmute at the end. Um, we also encourage you to read Bob's bio on the virtual platform. Um, and yeah, thanks so much for being here and I'll pass it off to Bob. All right, thanks everybody. So a uh, small group will go quickly. Right, I'll go quickly through the slides and you know, uh, and then we'll have time hopefully at the end for some good questions. So, um, you know, in coming here, a lot of the sessions I saw the exhibitors, it's about you know, how you can do telehealth visits, how you can put equipment out in both the hospital and clinic setting and, and at the home. This session is a little different, it's fascinating. It's sort of um, how you can use a digital therapeutic that works in harmony with uh, an in-person or telehealth visit, right? Because 99% of the rest of their life, they actually have to activate the things you're telling them in the care plan. So people don't end up in the emergency department for the half an hour they're on a televideo or in person. It's the other times they go awry because it's tough to follow a plan, right? So that's what we're going to talk about. How do you engage the whole person? Um, so my background, uh, my science is the science of developing and fostering human resiliency. So it involves about half of behavioral psychology and half of cognitive neuroscience. It's very interesting. Just one little tidbit I could tell you doing this around the world. We engage over 10 million lives a month. Outlook is by far the number one inhibitor or trigger of whether people listen, learn, or follow health instructions. There's not even a close second. Your outlook, very interesting. Yet, no one asks people what their outlook is, right? And then what do you do with that information? So very interesting. Um, okay, so a lot of what I'm gonna be talking about is patients are people too. And if you expect them to follow a plan, in this case, you're talking about addictive behavior, so substance abuse and other things. However, if you expect them to follow a diabetes plan, or they got out of the hospital from heart failure, they have a life too, right? And it can't be divorced from that life. It can't be an interruption to the life, right? So how do you do telehealth that integrates their life into the telehealth protocol, right? Outside of just doing the visit or collecting metabolic data via machine of some sort. And basically the idea of what you're gonna hear is we have an evidence-based science method, digital therapeutic that involves people in the plan of care in their life, okay? Because if you involve them, they are five to seven times more likely to do it. Right, it's just like well, your job. If your boss tells you what to do, and you have no input, you're less likely to do it. If you have a lot of input, you're more likely to do it. Well, that's true. How people live their life in general. Okay, so what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to walk you through a little bit of the science, and I'm going to show you an example of a digital therapeutic that we're doing in Montana uh, for substance use and what how it's worked and a couple other examples, right? Um, but first, I'm gonna just play you a 60 second video of three folks with psychosocial mental issues who uh, have experienced the combination of being treated by a behavioral health person and our digital therapeutic. So here you go, it's very interesting. Uh, the first gal is uh, that you'll hear is an opioid was an opioid pregnant mom. Uh, okay. Uh.
I'm still learning to communicate with people. These texts give me the support that I need without having to talk. The stories that are sent to my phone let me know I'm not alone and that others have gone through what I have. There's been some days where um, my depression has been really down when I woke up, but then when I get the message, you know, and it says, you know, if you feel down, get up anyway, get dressed and go. And it's helped where I have done it and the day has turned out great. One of the st struggles I have is leaving my house. Whenever I feel any kind of vulnerability, the first thing that happens is I'll isolate and I'll stay home. When I would get my message every morning, um, it just reminded me that I was connected to something bigger. It reminded me of the good things here. You know, like, it was like somebody was reaching out to me from Bridgeway saying, you know, come on, we need you here. We want you here. So one of the interesting um, about the first gal, she said she's relearning to communicate. So when you have uh, an addiction of some sort and a behavior, you know, it causes all sorts of issues. How do you communicate? How do you do it? And there's, there's, you need to kind of practice. And what is your brand? How do your children view you? Your parents, your parents <coughs> right? So it's not just instruction. It's how do you learn? We learn that. So she says. So she's relearning. We're teaching her by a more consistent flow of practice, how to relearn to communicate. By the way, she now has a steady job. She's pregnant again. She's doing very well just as a stand-up. So what we're gonna be talking about, you know, a lot of the stuff, like I said, in telehealth is human to human. I'll do a video call or chat. We're talking about this next item of digital to human. How do you augment that, right? And by the way, our system, we do put out a lot of medical devices, but today's session is really understanding the person and how you deal with them. Okay. Um, so basically, the basic thesis is the way healthcare provides customer service, patient engagement, right? In general, there's a lot of the way doctors, nurses, not necessarily social workers, but they're taught a lot about what's on the right. But meanwhile, if you look at why people, uh, for example, with precision medicine, what's the difference how precise the diabetic formulary is if 50% of the people aren't taking it? <laughs> right, it, it's like, so, and the reason why people come off things or don't follow things is mostly on the left, right? So does your behavioral say exacerbate your physical condition? Does your physical condition exacerbate your behavioral say yes? So in other words, you have to treat both of those. So the expertise that we've built into the digital therapeutic is on the left, and we embed the clinical kind of care plan, the physiology of it within it, right? So it's an engagement protocol that sits on top of a clinical <coughs> protocol, right? So that's the idea. Um, and it's all about treating the person. So now I'm gonna about to get into the specifics on how we do it. I just want to show you while today's talk is sort of behavioral health and addiction, the center column. I just want to show you applying this technique uh, via our partners who are healthcare plans, providers, hospitals, pharmaceutical companies, medical device companies. We're deployed all over the world doing this. And the outcomes are tremendous if you combine the, the digital therapeutics. So just to show you. Um, and by the way, for the, most of these outcomes were rural communities. So, for example, in Nebraska, we reduced preterm birth. In Kenya, Africa, we reduced preterm birth from 12% to under 1%, uh, significant reduction in ED, dealing with understanding a woman's anxiety, stress, depression, and addressing it right earlier. Okay. How, how large populations are you working with in that? First column. Tens of thousands or use, hundreds of thousands. Use your app. Yeah. Wow. And there's actually no physical app. It's messaging. You'll see okay. in a second. All right. Right. There's no physical app because you'll see why there's a level of intimacy and personalization you can't get necessarily in an app. So, uh, the, again, I'm not going to cover all the stats, but I just want you to see that the technique, you know, is used across the board. Um, 
we had a joint program with the American Heart Association because they needed a behavioral science and they needed a way to individualize their care plans. So, and the same is true in diabetes. Interestingly, the third stat, uh, we've increased people actually showing up for appointments and staying on therapy. So, it, you know, they work together, right? The idea is it works together. Okay, so um, now we're gonna focus on the use of the digital therapeutic for addictive behaviors and addiction, okay? And then we're gonna walk you through some examples, okay? Um, <clears throat> so anyway, um, what do you think with addiction? Well, you know, folks who are addicted have a lot of impact and you can see some of those, right? So it's not necessarily an easy thing, right? To change a lifestyle and a change in addictive behavior. And it has a ripple effect in the whole family. It's almost that people do have family members. It's a family problem, right? Not an individual problem, okay? Because maybe the wife, the kids, the husband, you know, everyone's affected. So I just gave this a similar talk at, at Wharton. Um, so then I say, well, how many people do you know with addiction, right? And, you know, we could all think of it for a second. Uh, and then I'm, I cover a little bit about, you know, kind of the science of addiction. But basically what I want to show is there's two major types of addiction. A lot of people just think of substance addiction, okay? Right, which we all know that could be alcohol, you know, drugs, those types of things. There's tremendous amount, especially with COVID now, as exasperated process addiction. Okay, and I'm going to show you what some of those are in a second. Right, so it's I'm addicted to a process. I'm addicted to uh, a substance. So, as an example. If you add up all these addictions, you can argue somewhere between 15 and 16% of America exhibits addictive behaviors. So these are actual stats of percent of people. The highest is cigarettes at 15%. But you can see there's sex addiction, exercise addiction. Just look at Tiger Woods. It ruined his life for 20 years. He was a sex addict, okay? He was addicted to the process of sex. What, whatever your addiction is, right? Um, and remember, these are the same people that have diabetes, COPD, respiratory, pregnant, okay, you know, it's not isolated, right? And again, there's a lot of negative consequence. So then I typically ask again, now with that definition, how many people do you know with addiction? So it was fascinating when I just did this talk at Wharton. It was like, I know four or five people or three people. And then it was like, okay, I know 30 people. Okay. Um, you know, and for those social workers in the room, you're definitely more attuned to this, right? But typically the issue is in the medical community, you're not as much. And if you look at, just as an example, the medical community just servicing people with chronic conditions who are not coded for behavioral health, Many of them are walking around with anxiety, stress, depression, you know. So what do you do with all those folks, right? Um, so the question is, in behavioral health, are standard treatment options enough? So these are examples of typical options that you may do via televideo, telehealth, or in person, or some combination, right? Um, and the more rural, in some respects, the harder it is to do some of these. Amen. Okay. What's that? Amen. Yeah. So, um, so the question is, a lot of the standard treatments have definitely demonstrated effectiveness. The question is, can we help them even be more effective? And then the other issue is, if you look at the bottom, I didn't put the stats for all the addictions, but for example, under 10% of people who should go for treatment so armed. So it's like, okay, so the 90% aren't, right? Like, okay, 10% of people on tobacco aren't going for any behavioral treatment. So the question is, what can you do and how can you augment and how can you engage people in their lived environment, right? You know, 
So, and how does it work in tandem with the treatment plan? So that's what we're going to get into now. We're going to dive into it. Um, what I'm going to do, uh, the example we're going to give is a program in uh, rural Montana around substance use offenders, those who come out of prison and who are picked up by the police, but given the option to go to court treatment versus be arrested. And we're going to actually show you that program. Before I do that, just to give you an idea, this, this is a 60 second animated video of one of our programs dealing with smoking cessation. And it kind of walks you through how it works and that type of thing. Um, so I just want to give you an idea of the whole program so you get a feel for it. The Quit for Kids program educates and supports pregnant women, parents, and caregivers of children up to seven years old who want to live a tobacco-free life. Sometimes the hardest part of quitting smoking or vaping is feeling like you don't have encouragement or advice. With Quit for Kids, you're never alone. The program shares helpful information, including tips to manage smoking and vaping cravings, information on healthy child development, and advice on creating and maintaining a healthy lifestyle. To get started on this free program, text quit for kids to 53016 and fill out the short form to get enrolled. Once you do, you'll receive texts with tips on topics like steps to quit smoking or vaping, emotional support, trigger, craving, and stress management, coping with withdrawal and preventing relapse, healthy eating, and child's growth milestones. The program also offers real-time support for common problems many experience during their journey to quit. These in-the-moment responses are delivered when you text these specific keywords. Trigger for support when feeling a craving. Mood for feel-good motivational messaging. Relax for comforting words to help deal with anxiety. Song for a link to uplifting music. Spirit to make you feel stronger. You can choose to connect with a quit coach by texting the phone number in your welcome message to get personalized support that will help you stay smoke free. Text quit for kids to 53016 to get the encouragement you need to quit smoking or vaping for yourself and your child. You can do this. It's an interesting, we're going to get into the specific program in Montana, but it's a push pull strategy so they can interrupt the protocol. Like some times people get an urge to smoke after dinner or at a certain point, you know. Uh, so how do you alter their mindset for 15 minutes, whether it's drugs or smoking, then you're 50% less likely to relapse, so to speak, if you give people. So we're there in the moment with them. It could be Saturday at 2 in the morning, right? And when you tell us something, like texting, it alters the regimen and it deals with your situation in the moment because setting up an appointment to do a tell-all session three days from now is not the ticket because you got 10 other problems by that. Now, having said that, the counselor who's going to see you three days from now, wouldn't it be great for him or her to know you've had these issues the last week? Because a lot of times when people get on televideo, they have so many issues, they don't know what to say, and they may forget to say the most important one. And they may not understand the patterns and correlations, but if the if your care team saw the data, it could really help inform and have a more powerful visit, whether that's in person or television. Okay, so let's look at the general science applied. Now we're getting into kind of my science that you're saying, unlearning and learning. So, you know, for those of you who know a little bit about epigenetics, sometimes if you have come from an environment or family, there's certain things you have to unlearn. You know, addiction, some things like other things is almost could be inherited uh, culturally within the family, right? So Ge genetically within the family. With genetically within the family, right? And learned behavior within the family. So anyway, just I want to point out that the healthcare doesn't apply best practices in its delivery, customer service delivery compared to other industries. So for example, let's use an example. If you wanna learn the piano, you may get instructions for 30 minutes once a week or an hour, but you're told to practice. Without practice, 
you know, so in football, to give you an example, it's 32 to 1 ratio of practice to play. If you're learning to act, if you want to be in a play, right? Kelvin, you you would be good to play the whole time, the whole thing. So, um, you know, it's it, the director may be giving you instruction, but then you have to practice. Where's the practice in healthcare? You're told what to do. How do you practice it? That's the key. In your stressed out environment, there's one thing to sit in a group or individual session, then I go back to my crazy stressed out world. How do I practice it? And that's what we're going to show you, right? That's what we do, right? We help people practice what the care plan is saying to do in the lived environment, in between all the sessions, right? So we're going to focus now on uh, RIMROC is a leading behavioral health organization in the state of Montana. Okay. And um, they work with the, the Attorney General and the Department of Health, and they handle a lot of the uh, substance abuse cases, both people coming out of prison who were nonviolent crimes related to that, and um, folks within the community. And the program has six different Native American Indian tribes, okay? Uh, and our system culturally adjusts based on what tribe you're at, or in other places, if you're in a vulnerable community, it individualizes to the person, right? So, um, okay, so these are typical things you'd see, goals and objectives, you know, in a, uh, a program addressing substance use, right? But these are things that we do, reinforce therapies outside the session. We're gonna give you the punchline at the end, reduce the relapse rate, reducing recidivism, right? So, and the program, the state can only afford and the coaching can only afford, you know, it's more intensive for a few months than less intensive and it typically stops at six months. But if you're going to change a habit and a behavior, not easy. So our digital therapeutic goes for one year minimum. And now we're working with the state to increase it, right? Because it takes a while to get people back adjusted, it's not necessarily easy. And our cost at about 50 to three bucks a month, the patient is very doable as in deal. You know, that's the cost. So very doable. Okay. So in what you're gonna see some examples of how we message people on how the program works, but just to sum it up, we're addressing, these are the types of things they're learning in this court treatment and drug program from a peer specialist or behavioral counselor or social worker. But this is what we're reinforcing, right? Thinking errors, big issue. I don't think I could get back to society. I don't think I could get a job. I don't think I could get this. Well, if you're not, if you're thinking that way, it's harder to correct the problem, right? So how do we change someone's outlook? How do we change their perspective? And it's not from a couple sessions once in a while, right? So. These are the things we work on, and I'll show you examples of those in the messaging that they get. And mostly via text messaging, about half the messages have a, uh, a percent of messages have a link to a little video and have a link to a little care page, one mobile web page. Anything more than one page, cognitive overload, people will shut it down. Okay, it has mm -hmm. to be short, simple, it has to fit into their lifestyle. So, to get a little deeper, these are some of the different topics. Interestingly, um, well, I'll talk about it in a second. So, and we supply a lot of peer videos and things to them. This is what, and they can submit their own story. This is how I coped, and then we spit it back to the team. People love that. They love peer stories, more so than the clinicians. Like, this is how I cope. It's great. People love it. So um, basically how the digital therapeutic works, these all work to be configured to the treatment plan. So in here, some of these people start in partial day, they go to intensive outpatient, they go to outpatient, and GOMO actually continues past outpatient. So we know when they're going through the phases, the counselor can hit a button, the patient can hit a button, you know, 
And uh, it brings them through, it works in conjunction with the phases to help them go through the phases. So it's all configured to be in harmony with the treatment protocol that the providers are using. Um, and then the messaging changes. Now, one thing I want to point out, we also, we're asking a lot of questions, like we said, so we're collecting a lot of life factor data points. But here's something that the digital therapeutic discovered that would have been harder to without it. So if you look at the parenting, when we first started this, we didn't have a parenting message track. Okay, what we discovered, a lot of the people who weren't adherent to, weren't likely to continue, one of their big issues is how they deal with their children for those who have parents. When we added a series of parenting track, all of a sudden for that whole group, 50% more activation. Like we're helping them to deal with their children. Like they need practice. They need coaching, they need, and this is not something, all these topics, it's just hard to do in a half an hour, 15 minutes, an hour. You can give some advice, but how do they go back and do it? And then we reflect with them on it. You know, it's very interesting. And then in drug court, like when they have to appear, you know, Sally, how do you feel about your parents as a judge on a one to five? So based on what she says, we give her help. And if it's like, uh, I'm really freaked out, and it is hours that the counselors work with the peer specialist. We immediately escalate to the peer specialist, and you know, because we know who's their specialist, and then who can deal with that. So you know, when we find out things that could be an adverse event, it immediately escalates according to the protocol of our the provider, right? What happens if it's after hours? So, so say it's like two o'clock in the morning. So if we're asking certain questions or indicating something at two in the morning, um, we'll let them know that, hey, we're informing your team, but they're not, our system has all the hours. Because sometimes our clients also have an after hours nurse triage or something, so we'll bring it to that. But otherwise we'll let them know, you know, no one's here now, okay. you know. So we're not setting an expectation that there's any immediate response. So similarly, say somebody texts that it looks like it's uh, sort of can't, they can only respond with sort of like specific responses, but what if somebody's feeling like suicidal? Yeah, so um, basically depending on the program and how we ask mm -hmm. the questions, I'm not showing you all the questions. Got it. Okay. If someone's feeling suicidal, we definitely ask questions that lend itself to that. Plus, they could text one thing, and that may have its own triage Got it. on its own. But those are all things we configure with, with the team we're working with. How do you want to handle those things? Because all our providers are different. Some sure. want so the system business rules are configured. And then the other big thing with the digital therapeutic the support person, the caregiver. So these things are family problems. So let's just say it's the guy and his wife is trying to help, okay? But she doesn't always know exactly what to do. She's not trained on how to deal with stigma and these things. She can't always be there in the counseling sessions, taking care of the kid. So we send the support person help, not only of ideas of what to do, give them a feel for what the person's going through, but also their own fatigue. You know, they get fatigued, right? So, so we, we help them. Big differences. And the data is fascinating when you integrate a family member and then you see who's doing what and the family member. So the support person regiments are both getting them to understand how to work with your loved one and also how to help yourself. Yes, Cal. Um, quick question. Um, uh, the peer specialist, is that being provided by your uh, peer provider that's part of the team? Or yeah, so in out? this case, the provider is Rimrock, they're a large behavioral health organization. They're providing the behavioral counselors help and the peer support specialists. You know, they're doing the physical aspect, which I'm not showing. You know, there's sessions individual, there's some group sessions that people participate in. And this is just 
basically it's all designed to reinforce the types of learning that they're doing in the section, cognitive bias, thinking errors, all that. What's the reading level for this? Yeah. So um, most of the programs are put through a fifth grade reading level. It depends on our client, the population, the situation. We've had ones that were third grade, ones that weren't necessarily that way. Some of these seem a little sophisticated. Yeah, so, you, you know, um, the, <clears throat> so they're all done to different various aspects. So and you do other languages as well? Yeah, so most of our programs are in English and Spanish, and then we have custom languages in, in a lot of them. So um, and the other thing is it's highly individualized, which is hard to get out in this session. So if you today have a high level of anxiety or you today can't sleep, we'll typically ask you what time do you go to sleep. Ten, we'll start sending you things at nine or eight at night. So people are more transparent because they see immediate reciprocity. So people with addictive behaviors or any issues, look, we all ruminate on stupid stuff, right? So, but people with this type of mental challenges ruminate even more. If you're not addressing it in the moment, the rumination builds, and that's when you have adverse events. So, so we're trying to be there. And then example, just to show you, this is from a different program, but um, if there's a night shift worker, if there's something else, you know, we ask a lot of different questions depending on what we're trying to help them. A lot of times when it gets dark at night in the winter months, is there's more ED visits, people panic. So if we see that happening, we increase the amount of messaging, we give them cooking tips and nutrition, you know, things to do, games to play, you know, because people panic. So that's the idea. And there's a decent number of little videos in here. We do a lot of peer videos from folks who've gone through this. And then to your point, there's different how are you doing surveys which get at, could get at suicidal, other types of things after they answer a certain way. There's follow-up messaging that we're not showing you if you're answering. I'm not doing well. There's follow-up stuff. Yes. Do you have tracks that set up for specific um, drugs of abuse? Uh, for example, in Virginia, we have uh, a specific new and abuse disorder crisis pretty much, and uh, being able to find effective treatments for that is is pretty limited and Medicaid limits our uh, contingency management yep. uh, programming. And so I was wondering, I mean, something like this sounds like it would be super helpful for that particular drug. Yeah, so it depends. Like in Montana, it's a lot of meth and other things. In New Jersey, it's opioids. And so it could be set. And also, we have a Medicaid assisted treatment version. I'm not showing that here, but so. Uh, and one of our gals is um, one of the foremost experts in alcohol substance abuse, you know, and medicated assisted treatment. But, you know, so anyway, this is, so yes, we can configure it and it can also deal with your med management, you know, and mm -hmm. issues associated with that. So like an MAT program, but specific information kind of underneath it if you're struggling with meth. Or yeah, or yeah, in other programs, it could be an antipsychotic or antidepressive. Like if we understand that, we can adjust because there may be side effects of the meds. So we can help people understand the side effects and what to do, you know. And then this is just an example of one of uh, their escalations. Um, so we're telling the behavioral health, this is what if they scored a rating of two or less, the Rimrock wants to know right away. So we do an escalation to Rimrock. Uh, and they know what to do with this. It's just coded in a certain way. Right. So when we work with an organization, the escalations are coded in a way that everyone knows what to do with it when they get it, because we've agreed on how to do it. Um, you have You've said twice, you've, you've referred to this as a digital therapeutic a couple of times. Does that mean that you're FDA approved? And no, it's not like it um, goes through the FDA pharmaceutical okay, so, digital it. therapeutic. No. Um, now, we have some pharma companies using us that may elect to do that. The issue is um, we haven't found that beneficial because then every little change, the FDA doesn't have a great process for digital therapeutics. 
So any little change you do in the program, you have to resubmit. Mm -hmm. Like it's yeah. so you learn stuff. Like we added the parenting track mm -hmm. because that's what we found from the data. It took us a couple of days. It was easy. Like you couldn't do that if it were that. So we haven't found the benefit to the community to do that. And then in our system, you could also ask questions anytime. And again, it'll say if it's after hours, hey, you know, don't get back. You could just, this is to your point, I'm suicidal on this or that. You could do this at any time as well. So, and then you saw in the quick for smoking one, there were texting keywords. Here's the ones here, hall is a big word, substance abuse, hungry, angry, lonely, tired. Those are the times when people relapse, typically. So if you feel that, you text Paul, and it goes into triage mode. So that's why when I put at the very beginning, how do you involve the person in their plan of care? I think you're starting to see they answer questions and adjust. We do this and adjust. We escalate to a counselor when they need it, okay? I can interrupt my regimen, tell and get something, and then it adjusts. Right, like, so you're really working with the person and the data for the care teams are fascinating. The correlations from predictive and non-predictive analytics are fascinating and it enables a visit to be much more productive because you can see, oh, oh, Sally, I see you've indicated you're, you're highly stressed over the last three weeks and for this, like maybe Sally wouldn't have brought that up on the call, but now you can see the data. So it's really kind of cool. Um, I'm almost done. So real quick, a couple more slides. So the technique that we um, that we built is called Mild. Um, it's an integrated micro learning, micro doing, right? Because remember going back to the slide, practicing. Okay, doing, learning is one thing, but if we we do things and then. A lot of times we reflect, so we'll give you a something to do, and then a week later, we'll say, oh, how'd you do with that, and what did you learn from that? Like, just to get people think, because in cognitive neuroscience, sometimes you have to repeat something six times for it to make it to long-term memory, as an example. So if you get people to reflect, when they panic, they can recall it. And so how do you get people to form a neuron pattern to recall something when you want them to? You know, not to get that deep. So we use a technique, micro learning, micro doing, and it's quick, it's short, it's snackable bites. It's not long. Everything's quick and short, which then they learn that. They like that. Okay, quick and short. It's like, how you know, at work, you get the next long email you delete. Okay, that's healthcare in general, right? Okay, so here's the summary slide, my last slide. So here's the whole approach in a nutshell. So the idea is how do we take what the clinicians are saying and the care plan and get you to practice in your environment, home, work, and play? Because that's going to change your outlook, that's going to change your behavior, and that's how you're going to develop and foster resiliency. So you'll see, practice nurtures routines. A routine is not a schedule yet. Okay, then we got to reinforce it. So by personalized guidance and reinforcing it, now you form a new schedule. So just picture it. Like I have, I have an addictive behavior. I was on drugs. Now I got, I want to get a job again. I want to have kids. I, I need a new routine. I need a new schedule. Right. Repetition fosters confidence and builds self-believability. Okay. So now we're starting to say, well, maybe I can do this. Because we give them little things to do. We reward them. Like little things. Okay, maybe I can get through this. You know what? Maybe I can change, right? Even, even if this were diabetes, you know what? Maybe I can eat better, right? Whatever the case is. Believability alters outlook. Okay, if we can alter their outlook, thinking errors goes down, all the things that keep them down, that's the outlook, the new schedule, form, Habit, a new habit. That's what we're trying to do. Habits then get into muscle memory because recall, ah, if this happens, I'm not running to the emergency room, I'm doing this. If this happens, you know, okay, oh, right. I walk my dog, I take my pill. Okay, yes, I remember that now, you know. 
Um, and then that's what hey, creates. Hey, Bob, I just want to let you know you're at time. So. Okay. That was it. Um, done. Okay. Sorry. Um, <laughs> develop and foster resiliency in our world. And uh, thank you, everyone, for listening and coming. And uh, hopefully, some of this helped. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, Bob, what is the. the the number one or two uh, requested services, I guess that should be. Well, we right? do a lot of Medicaid. So we do millions of lives in 15, 20 states in Medicaid. So I would say in the Medicaid environment, the top things are maternal child health, prenatal to age eight, because all the heat measures, the baby vaccines, all the stuff, prenatal postpartum depression, we're doing a program in Georgia, Moms Heart Matter, for vulnerable, underserved rural moms. A lot in the Black community, a lot of deaths postpartum from hypertension and those things. So we're working with the FQHCs, the state, you know, so as an example. So I would say maternal child health, um, behavioral health, is I'm talking about Medicaid now, right? Diabetes. Um, and asthma, depending if it's an urban environment, from all the diesel fuel, tons of asthma, and then child obesity in rural communities. So that's the big Medicaid. In Medicare, we're doing more COPD, heart, diabetes, chronic kidney, you know, those types of things. Are you finding that Medicaid is, is covering cost, or how it, how does the the financial piece work? Yeah, well. Some of what we do, like are eligible for some of the new Medicaid, Medicare reimbursements, right? So we can work with you on that. And then other times based on our client's cost of delivery, like for example, in the example I gave of Rimrock, for what they pay us, they're able to have 50% more patients with the same staff. Because we're doing a lot of the communications. Yeah. So from a cost of good soul, from a staff scaling, you know, it, it's big. So sometimes it's not covered by Medicaid but because they're only a few bucks a month, depending on all your other right. costs, you know, non-reimbursable phone calls, hassle, people ending up, you know, what's the cost, you know, of that. So it all depends on the program. Do you have um, uh, any research-based information? Yeah, we can send you. you give cards? me your, Oh, I love. Yeah, it. we have white paper. We have a lot of medical economic data. We're not lacking from that because we're not new. I mean, we're fairly well deployed. Uh, it's working well. It's growing. Our latest is we're addressing foster care. And then hopefully that's going to scale across the U.S. Interestingly, in Medicaid, they don't really have data about the difference in cost, treatments, handling of kids in foster care, foster parents, or home. They don't have. So we're doing our first program in the U.S. on that. We'll be launching. So Virginia is big on their um, the substance abuse right now with a, what they call an arts program, and I'm I'm an FQHC person. Okay. And, Director of three um, OBATs, office based addiction treatment. And when I heard you talk, I just had like, well, yeah, no, this is, I'm just going to write that down.